Hello, everyone. I'm Marek Wyszynski, and I'm delighted to be here. And most importantly, I'm happy you're here. I'll tell you the idea of the course came from, from the realization that most Feldenkrais lessons include the ribcage in movements. What we do in our practice when we every week on weekend, when we prepare lessons for the following week, we fill out a questionnaire that helps us catalog lessons because we have over thousands of lessons now in our library and we want to catalog them so, so participants could easily navigate and, and search for lessons about body part, lesson about movement pattern, ease, etc. And I realized that for past several years, every week when I fill out that form, I check ribcage, I check ribcage, I check ribcage. It is with practically all, all Feldenkrais lessons. Another thing is that ribcage is on one hand so important, but on the other hand, in 32 years of my practice, I've never had a single person who would come to me and say, Marek, I'm here to address my thorax. People come with neck pain, people come with shoulder pain, knee pain, my back is killing me, my elbow hurts, I have a tennis elbow, I keep on spraining my ankles, but hardly ever I would, I would see somebody who wants to address that body part, maybe with exception of osteoporosis, kyphosis, then, then the fractures of the spine, of course. But other than that, it's a hidden gem that most of us don't realize. And, and it's involved with practically everything from top down. If you talk about rehabilitation of your neck, you want to improve herniated discs or some problems with impingement of nerves, how can you not address movements of your ribcage with your everyday life? Shoulder troubles, people have rotator cuff, people have frozen shoulders. How can you help somebody with shoulder issue without addressing this important part of the, the complex of ribcage, sternum, thoracic spine, lumbar spine? I would say stiff ribs are one of the first places I would look into when somebody comes to me with back pain. Maybe hip joint will be number one, and right after that, can I improve person's distribution of movement through ribs? So ribs are not just like a fixed thing that doesn't move, but to unload the lumbar spine. And the same thing down the kinetic chain, hip impingement, knee troubles, ankle twists, how person is moving using this important big part of their body, thorax, is involved practically with, with with everything that I do. And not only body, but if you think of mind, anxiety, the patterns of anxiety, the body pattern of anxiety, how we hold ourselves when I don't feel so secure, when I feel a little scared, when I have a panic attack, when I'm, I feel I'm under stress and tension. Of course, there will be manifestations of what I do with this important body part. Come up to standing, interrupt sitting for a moment. And as you're standing, let's take a look at things like balance. How can balance be good without well-functioning ribs? Imagine you are a tight tightrope walker. Imagine walking one foot after the other. Make a, hopefully you have five, four feet in front of you that you could walk. Bring your arms out to the side. Imagine you're high up, the wire is hanging high up. And watch, what do you do with your ribs under your armpits, middle section? Have you ever seen how tightrope walkers make adjustments, right in balance through these very gentle side bends of the body? What happens, however, for many of us who have difficulties with balance is to make it rigid. Person is afraid of falling and they stiffen. Their ribcage will become one box. None of this nice fluid 
slinky like motion, but rather one block. And then what happens? Try walking on your tightrope with very stiff held rib cage. You would do rapid, abrupt movements of the arms, but that wouldn't do. Can you feel that? Stop for a moment. Look around yourself. Look to the right, look to the left, and feel how your ribs participate in movements if looking in looking around. Now you can have your arms down, just normal. You want to cross the street and you look right and you look left. And pay attention how well your rib cage is participating in action. Great. Come to sit in front of the screen for a little bit more. I'll share with you what my plan is. I'll share again the PowerPoint. We'll do a little theory. This one. So. so how we will work together today in the next four sessions. First, I believe in really gaining knowledge, you gaining understanding, understanding what's inside you, how it works, how the, the pattern of movements that come out from biology, from how joints are structured, how they permit movement in certain directions, how they restrict movements in the other directions. So knowledge will be our first, first step. Then each session will have Feldenkrais lessons. Today, we will do a little bit of an ABC. This will be a preliminary session. So it won't be one full lesson addressing a specific particular movement pattern, but we will introduce movements based on Feldenkrais lessons, but in a smaller, smaller range. Then each session will have a homework session some practices, some practical application of what you're learning that you could do every day. And of course, questions and answers because good questions can benefit everyone. These are resources that I'm using. I very often use this complete anatomy app that I'll share some screens of the joint skeleton a, a wonderful book by Donald Newman called Kinesiology of Muscular System, Musculoskeletal System, and also the work of Diane Lee on thorax with her concepts of ring, rings, that each rib with its spinal ver vertebral spine, spinal bone, and the sternum create a ring, a fantastic concept. You don't have to buy these books unless you are a practitioner or some clinician or somebody who's working with clients, then I would recommend those. Uh, for, for normal public, it's not needed. It will be an over, overkill. They're, they're too, too kind of specific for, for clinicians. In these next five sessions, four sessions plus two days, you are going, we will work on learning how the rib cage is not only one piece, but we will learn how to move in four sections or at least three sections of our rib cage. How to recognize movements in the upper thorax, which is constituted by two top ribs and vertebra T1 and T2, the first thoracic. So the first is upper thorax, the top two ribs. They're connected to a manubrium, a part of the sternum. Sternum is like a sword with a long blade, with a xiphoid process, and with a handle. So the first two, the upper thorax, connects, with, connects the spine with the manubrium. They have a two connections there. Then we have the middle thorax, your middle ribs. These are ribs between three and six. Again, they wrap around, they go from your spine behind you to the side and connecting to your breastbone. 
Then we have lower thorax with ribs number seven and 10 that connect with a chondral uh, tissue, not directly to the breastbone through the joints, but through common cartilages. So, and then finally, we have the lower thorax, which is thoracolumbar junction, meaning the last two ribs that actually don't touch, don't attach to your breastbone. That's a view of ideal spine. As you see, the spine is not a straight structure. The notion of whole, having spine like a stick is a wrong notion. We want to have curves. We want to have good curves. And actually, these curves are quite substantial. If you look at the neck, we have 30 to 35 degrees of backward bending, spine in what's called lordosis or arching. The middle section is bent forward. It has a normal kyphosis, which is about 40 degrees. That's a sub substantial amount of forward bending. And then in the lower back, we have a 45 deg degrees of bending backward, again, arching. So most of us have the neck and lower back that is an arch backward. And this middle section to which your ribs are attached that are in forward bending, in gentle amount of thoracic kyphosis. When we look of, on the spine and spinal movements, it's pretty straightforward, but when you start to include all the rings of the ribs that attach to the breastbone in the front, to the collarbones in the front, then it becomes much more complex. There, there is no spine that exists without rib cage in in science, in, in phys physical therapy, in medicine, we can look at the spine and, and talk about just the spine, but really functionally, you have to include your ribcage, your thorax. Here's a view of uh, distribution of movements. First, green, blue, and purple. Green is forward and backward bending. And this is dissected by sections, like between your occiput, the, meaning the head and the first vertebra, atlas, and go on all the way down to L5 or S1, which is the bottom of your spine. So different distribution of movement with forward and backward bending. As you see, thoracic spine, there are some segments that don't bend forward and back a lot, nothing compared to the neck and also nothing compared to the lower back. And if you look at the places that have the largest amount of movement, C5, C6, for example, or L5, S1, and L4, L5, these are areas that often we injure. Places that move too much, most often get, these places are places of injury, herniated discs, the most common place is L4, L5, L5, S1, or C5, C6. This is where we see most herniations. So green is forward and back. Horizontal meaning rotations. As you see, rotation, except for this one magical vertebra at the top of your neck between C1 and C2, atlas and axis, which constitutes 50% of your total range of motion, that just one vertebra that rotates like a periscope, allowing your head to turn right and left so much, the rest of the spine contributes proportionally but small amounts throughout the neck, throughout the middle back, lumbar spine, barely any twisting movement. Finally, her frontal plane, these are movements from side to side. Again, pretty even distribution throughout the entire spine. So what we're looking for is we're looking for movements that will be evenly distributed throughout your whole system. So what I was saying is that the ribcage in the most part is the place of stiffness where we hold ourselves too much. It's a 
I would say it's a misconception to think that Feldenkrais is about always increasing movement, increasing range of motion, because there are places in our body that move too much. When I work with people's spines, for example, lower back or neck, it's usually not that I want to have more movement right away. I want to find out, is the person moving too much in that place? However, in their rib cage, hardly ever I see too much movement. And, and I would say that off the bat, you can think of improving your range of motion, improving your flexibility will be beneficial for you in this section of the body. Let's see how we're doing. Interesting, good, so-so, good. Okay, are you still with me? I'm going to show you our skeleton. We'll take a look at this section of the body from the front view. So here you have a skeleton, human skeleton, the front part. You see breastbone with three parts. If we zoom in, it looks like a tie. If we zoom in, we see manubrium and then rib number one and rib number two right underneath your collarbone. This is your upper thorax that will be learning how to mobilize, how to move. Then we have this middle section from rib three on to number six that constitutes middle rib cage. Then as you see, these lower ribs connect through common cartilage. They don't connect straight to the breastbone, but they merge in through the common cartilage. If we look behind, it gets really fantastic. How is your rib attached to your spine? Actually think for a moment, close your eyes and just imagine one of your ribs, any rib that you can feel and sense rib that is coming from the front, going underneath your armpit, or somewhere on the side of the body, and then it moves backward toward your spine. What's your image of how that rib is attached to your spine? Most of us will, will say, I have no idea. Somehow it must be attached, but can I feel it? Now, go ahead, open your eyes, and let's, let's take a look at one of those ribs. Let's call it, like, what is it? This is our seventh rib. Maybe we'll go up sixth rib. That's a little bit covered by your uh, scapula here, by your shoulder blade. But if we zoom in, that rib is attached to two vertebrae one above and one below. So it sits in between two vertebrae where the disc will be in between those two bones. So this rib connects, has two articulate surfaces on top and the bottom vertebra. And that's not even enough. There is another place where the rib interact with your spine here. This little cartilage is the joint between your rib surface, not the tip of the rib, but closer to the upper middle section. And that connects with your transverse process of the spine, the kind of wing of the spine. So your rib connects with three places. Let's take a look here. Right now we're somewhere between the two ribs. We're taking a look from the front view. You have one vertebra above, one vertebra below. There is a space here where you will have this. And that rib connects to the top, bottom, and also with the wing of the rib underneath if we look here. Gorgeous, right? So movement, good flexibility requires good mobility between in three joints, in three joints, upper, lower, 
and this this part here. So thorax is composed of your ribs, of your spinal column, and your breastbone, the three parts, the little tip cycle process at the end, the sternum, and manubrium, the handle of the sternum. Great. If you look at, for example, your breastbone only, you see on the outside of the breastbone, these are these holes where the ribs fit. Right? This is the front of your breastbone and the side of the breastbone with the places where they articulate. Great. If I to show you a rib, like a rib, how it looks. It's basically kind of thin, not really robust. It can bend a little bit. It, it can move, it can spring. This part at the end connects with your spine. And this part connects from the front in the, in, onto the breastbone. Let's take a first moment to lie down. Lie on your back, please. Let's examine. Our first movements. Make sure you are comfortable for the exploration. Make sure that your nervous system can listen, can pay attention to movement. If you're comfortable, close your eyes. And let's begin dissecting our thorax into three components. The upper, the middle, and for simplicity, the lower part of the ribcage. Listen to the first ribs, those top ribs. Pay attention to the ribs underneath your collarbones. And listen to your breathing. You could even touch. Place your hands on, on your collarbones first. Place your hands on the collarbones. And if you place your hand a little bit above your collarbone, and don't be too harsh and don't, too, don't be too aggressive, but gently with your fingertips, press. Um, above your breast, or above your collarbone, and feel, can you feel hardness of the first ring of your ribs? The first ring of your ribs, the first rib is there above your collarbone. Sometimes it's very tender because muscles that attach to that rib cage, to the first rib, like scalene muscles, are so tense and tender that they're painful. So very gently, don't be abrupt, touch that first rib. The first ring is quite small. If you put your hands, put two index and thumbs together, making a little O like in front of you and look at it. This is about the size of your first rib, the ring of the ribs. If you think of that oval that you're making between your fingers, that's about the size of your first rib. Go back to palpating your first rib, right above your collarbone. You cannot touch it in front because it's covered by your clavicle, by your collarbone. You can touch it from above and press it downward toward your feet and you'll feel, oh, that kind of hardness that's 
my first rib. Now go under your collarbone in the front and the first bump that you will feel is actually your second rib. Can you identify, can you find it? Can you feel it? From collarbone down, touch the first bump. This is where your collarbone attaches, sorry, first rib attaches to your breastbone, to your sternum and trace it a little bit out to the side. This is your upper thorax. And we'll be exploring this in the next five sessions, how each of those sections move with breathing, with turning, with bending forward and bending backward, with lateral movements, and also with shifts of the body. Now, put your arms down at your sides. And for a moment, listen how that first two ribs breathe how are you breathing in those first top two ribs in the upper thorax is there motion is there a little lifting and lowering when you exhale is that part of you sink down to the floor to the to the feet. And when you inhale, are these two parts, two ribs lifting? Some of us have the movement there. Some feel, no, I don't feel much movement at all. And don't worry if you don't. Just realize I'm not familiar with this. Now, how about interlacing your fingers and putting it behind your head? If you want, you can bend your knees. If you like the lower back to be flatter and closer to the ground. And now very gently begin to lift your head, which is part of flexing your spine. And then come back. Don't do big movements, especially for those of you with osteoporosis or with maybe some history of fractures of the compression fractures. What we want to do in our work is to learn how to use different parts, how to increase movement throughout the whole system, but not just one particular place. So it doesn't serve as well when we go to the limit or we, when we start to do sit-ups and try to lift the head as far as you can. It's not going to serve you well. Just lift it a little bit and feel the ring of the first and second rib. Can you feel it? Can you feel rib one moving relatively to rib two, rib two relatively to rib three? Or is it too abstract? It could be that you haven't thought about chest that much throughout your life. So even focusing on just one rib or two ribs is, is too much to think at the moment. That's okay. Gently. That's right, leave it, put your hands down at your sides. And what about turning? Roll your head gently right and left. Again, don't go to the limit. Some of you turn and twist until you feel almost pain. No need to. Roll your head an inch, right? Half an inch, left. And sense, can you identify upper thorax, your first two ribs in movement of turning your face? in movement of looking a little bit to the right and to the left. Be gentle, learn how to be gentle. It will serve you very well and it will serve you forever. Some people say, well, but this doesn't last. My improvement doesn't last. If you learn how to be gentle with yourself, it will last forever. It will serve you forever. Roll little right, little left. Identify that ring of first, second rib. Is it turning? Lovely. Stop. Leave it alone. And now pay attention to the middle thorax. From rib number three down. 
to at least number seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe for simplicity reason, we will connect the part of the ribs between three and six, and then seven and ten into a unit of middle thorax. Feel your ribs. These will be large ribs, then wrap around. Think of the first rib under your armpit, the rib number four or maybe number five. How it comes from the sides, from behind you, from your spine, under your armpits. And then coming forward toward the breastbone. Place your fingers on one of those ribs. Place somewhere on the breastbone. If you want to find a third one, go to your collarbone. The first bump is your second rib. And then if you go to the next bump, this is already your third rib. And then right underneath will be fourth one. So somewhere third, fourth, fifth, and then start to trace the shape of that rib outward. Gently touching it. And then do the same thing with the fifth one. Lower down. Fourth, fifth, fifth, and sixth. Trace it downward. You will notice that it's not just a horizontal line. Ribs actually curve. They, they move. Can you feel how, what's the shape of the rib? Can you sense it? Can you see it in your body image that the ribs go out, then they go up, and then they go behind you? Now, the rib that you're touching right now, could you imagine where it attaches to your spine? Can you imagine where it inserts itself into your spine? Most likely to the space between two vertebra. Most likely, if, if I were to take that rib and push it a little bit, that whole ring from one on the right, one on the left, and I were to push it a little bit to the right and left, I would evoke turning of the two vertebra. There are only a couple places where ribs enter only one vertebra in your spine. Most of them, the end of the rib touches two. It inserts itself in the place between two vertebra where discs are, the intervertebral discs. And therefore, by mobilizing them, you mobilize a pair of vertebra. Beautiful. Leave it. Keep your image on those ribs and watch how you breathe, how, how they move. How are they moving as you inhale, as you draw air in, and as you ah, let go? What happens with that particular rib or pair of ribs? When you exhale, how those ribs express letting go? Sometimes our rib cage is in the permanent state of lifting. Sometimes our rib cage is in permanent state of depression, kind of compression. We feel like the whole world is pressing on our shoulders and on our chest. We feel heavy. Can you feel that your ribs can move? Expand, lift a little bit, and then drop simply. Exhale, letting go. Now, interlace your fingers, put them behind your head, go back to lifting your head, and now think of your middle thorax. What do your ribs do in the middle section from rib number three or vertebra number three? 
down fourth, and then four to five, and five to six, and so on in the middle section. Each one of us here utilizes our own habitual signature of movement. Each one of us will have certain ribs that move easily and other ribs that are held. Examine it for yourself now. How well you're lifting your head of, or bending forward. In the middle section, comparing to upper section, can you differentiate between the two? Somebody asked me here about cost costochondritics. Make sure that when you do our movements, you are always comfortable. You're not compromising. So again, lifting your head high, pulling with abdominals in a strong way on those ribs in front of you is not going to make you better. It's for you to sense clearer and you can sense it right from the beginning. That the rib either moves or it doesn't move. It doesn't have to lift the head to 60 degrees for you to sense it. Right from the beginning, it has a chance to move or maybe it bypasses movement and goes to a place like water. Water always finds the easiest groove. That's what we do with our skeleton too. We move along the paths that are easiest for us, most habitual. So don't use big size of movement. If you have broken ribs, if you have osteoporosis, if you have costochondritis, or if you don't have anything still, use small movement to listen to it, to experience it, to pay attention. Wonderful. Put your arm back, rest a moment. Both arms down. What about turning? Roll your head gently right and left. Can you sense the ring of the ribs? Number three, number four, number five, number six. Involve in you turning your nose, little right, turning your nose, little left, turning your head, looking to the right, to the left. Can you feel that they're actually not the same? You may find one direction is a little easier. You may find movement of ribs is so simple to one direction and the other direction, it may feel a little uphill. Beautiful. Stop for a moment. And let's go to our lower ribs. We can start at the lower back, or if you think of your kidneys, the 12th rib is a rib that just sticks out from the spine. It sticks to the right, it sticks out to the left, and it's actually not attached to any other part of your breastbone, for example. It just hangs out to the side. And the same thing it's with number 11 although number 11 is a little bit longer. Perhaps we can palpate them. Put your fingertips of your index fingers on your lower ribs, bottom of your rib cage, and go out to the side and go out to the side toward your flanks, toward your waistline. And if you palpate through the soft tissue, muscles, fat tissue of your abdomen, of your upper abdomen, it's possible that you will detect a little pointy edge tip of your rib number 11. If you find like, a, it's almost like when I'm palpating it on clients, it feels like the edge end of the pencil, like a rubber eraser. It's, it's pointy, and sometimes it's quite different on the right and left side. On one side, it may be more forward, maybe more rotated in one direction. 
See if you can find it. If you don't find it, don't worry. Touch your lower belly, upper belly tissues toward the where the belly con transfers into ribs. And if you palpate, you may find the very tip of rib number 11. Rib number 12 would be further toward your lower back. And for that, you might need to use your thumb if you were curious to find where number 12 is ending. It's just a few inches out to the sides. Again, if I were to bring on the screen the picture of our rib cage, the back number 12 is this thing. So what you were palpating is here. You see how it from vertebra number 12, the last thoracic. And this is, you see, this is quite interesting because in this particular place, it sticks out straight from the body of vertebra, not from the places in between, like let's say rib number 10 here that goes between vertebra number uh, nine thoracic and uh, 10 thoracic. But the last floating ribs are actually attached straight to the bodies of your vertebra. So this is number 11. And where you were palpating, you were palpating the very tip, the cartilage of that 11th rib. And if you went with a thumb backward toward the lumbar, toward your kidney, you have a chance to palpate number 12. Of course, the muscles have to be soft. Sometimes our muscles are so contracted that it's hard to find them. Good. And if you go above, then you will find the lower ribs, the lower thorax that connects to common cartilage that goes into the very bottom of your breastbone. Find place maybe the whole heel of your hands on the very bottom of your ribs in front and picture the bottom of your rib cage inserting itself into the breastbone at the bottom of your breastbone through common cartilage. And then again, listen to your breath. Can you feel breath in your lower thorax? If you want black belt in what we're doing, you can even dissect it between thoracolumbar and vertebrochondral thorax, meaning those ribs, that 12 and 11, that don't attach. What happens there? Can you feel breathing into the lower back? Some people have that area permanently arched, permanently contracted. The muscles are held there and that part of the back never can go to the floor. It never inhales, it never flattens, it just stays lifted arch until the person realizes it and starts to permit movement there and gradually soften the places, muscles that hold the arch. And then you can start to feel, oh yeah, I'm widening my back with each inhale. I'm flattening it. Then listen to the movement of the uh, ribs that move from your spine to those cartilages, the vertebral, from vertebra to chondral, meaning cartilage aspect. Can you feel breath there? How is it on the right? How is it on the left? And for our purpose, it will be fine if you connected all that experience of the lower thorax as one, that's okay, that's good enough. And feel breath in all three places. The upper thorax, first, second rib, the midsection, vertebral sternal. So the first one is vertebral manubrial, meaning that, that handle of the breastbone at the top. Then the middle section, vertebral 
sternal, and then the lower thorax, that's vertebrochondral, and the thoracolumbar, just those two pairs at the very bottom. How do you breathe throughout your different parts of your chest? Can you identify your own signature? Oh, I'm breathing mostly with my belly at the very bottom. In fact, there is so much for the past few decades now, we, we've heard about the belly breathing, that the belly breathing is good for us. And yes, it's good for us, but sometimes we emphasize too much of distension of the belly, of spilling our gut forward. And that actually is not so desired. Good breath, yes, it involves your diaphragm and it expands your belly, but it expands your back too, expands your right and left side. In fact, I was contemplating, preparing this workshop. I was thinking that I will start with breathing, but then I thought, no, breathing is so delicate that I would like people to get experience first so they can really reap the benefit of a new way of thinking, perceiving, experiencing your breath through all these different sections. So we'll leave breath to our last session. Now interlace your fingers, put them behind your head. Again, start lifting your head and see what's happening in the, your lower thorax. If you want black belt, think of the vertebral chondral, meaning ribs number seven, eight, nine, ten. Those ones that connect with your cartilages. Feel, how are you lifting your head right off the bat with your lower thorax? What's happening with it? Can you feel back pressing into the floor there? Or is that place arched and you're actually supporting yourself higher up, but not in the lower? And then what about the ribs number 12 and 11? Those false ribs or the, those floating ribs. They're called floating ribs because they float. They don't attach. Do floating ribs press into the floor? Each time you lift the head, again, you do not have to lift high. In fact, if you truly want black belt in this stuff, do first half an inch and then put the head back. Just the first moment. Do I sense the movement there? Or do I think I need to jam on it and actually force it? Because if so, forget it. It's it, in everyday life, every time you look at your shoes or look at the newspaper or the book or eat something, you want to see what's on your plate, you're bending, but you're not bending massively, bending a little bit. Where are you bending from? Upper, middle, lower, beautifully distributed? I don't know, I'm too lost. Well, that's why we're here. We're going to explore that. Good, stop, and now turn your head right and left and think of your lower thorax in service of you looking right and left. Our ribs in the lower from number seven to number 12 involve in your beginning to turn right and left. I'm not asking for stretching. Yes, you can push and pull to the limit and then feel something there. No, from the first, for, from the first millimeter. Is it there or isn't it? And if it isn't, why? What's holding it? Who's holding it? Beautiful. Stop, stretch out everything. Give yourself a minute of quiet time for your brain to process all that information, and you don't have to do anything, just quietly lie there.
And please bend both of your knees, roll to your side, come up to sitting and come closer to the computer. I'd like to show you what's happening in those joints. Uh, when we're moving forward and back first, and maybe also lateral bending. So I'll share the screen again. I'll show you this. Here is the article by uh, Diane Lee, uh, describing biomechanics of the thorax. And if you, if you go online to that, that place here, you can find the article let me pull it because it has nice picture in it. Share screen again, pictures here. Okay, so this is her article. And if we scroll, he, here's her concept of ribs as rings together with the spine vertebra and how they're attached to the front some research and then here we have the first movement of forward bending and what's happening in forward bending with our ribs so spine tilts the top vertebra tilts forward over the bottom one the front of the ribs lower so let's say when you lift your head what you were just doing with lifting of the head your upper vertebra would come tip forward, front of your ribs would go down, and then you will have this rotational movement, rotational movement of these ribs relatively to the vertebra above and below. Basically, this is called anterior rotation. Anterior meaning forward, anterior rotation of your ribs relatively to these joints as they insert into the bodies of vertebra and the disc, but also in the joint uh, between the transverse process and, and the rib. When we arch, meaning when we bend backward, it's the opposite movement. The front of the ribs lift up, the upper vertebra tilts back relatively to the bottom, and then we have posterior rotation, meaning rolling back. If you imagine a pencil and you roll a pencil, that's what the rib does. The rib rotates relatively to the two vertebra. And in side bending and rotations, we will explore that again in, in our future lessons. But for, for this moment now, I'd like you to picture the rib, your every single rib that you have can rotate relatively to the vertebral bodies. So keeping this in mind, come sit on the front edge of the chair, preferably solid so the, the chair is not gliding on the, on the wheels, something stable. You could do this in sitting on the floor as well, if you prefer. Think again. So if this is my thorax, my sternum and the cartilages, and this is the top of the sternum, if I put it like that, I need to lift myself a little bit, then you have these ribs that go around and in the back, Remember that place that I showed you with the two articulations with the vertebra above and the vertebra below. So like two fingers here, these are my two vertebra. And what happens is rotation, turning, turning of, of that rib around the two joints, upward, downward, upward, downward. And that's why the front that we saw on her photograph when you arching lifts up, when you bending, it goes down. Again, this is in the ideal world. This is what we want. This is one where we want to be after five sessions. We want to learn that every single pair of ribs could do this kind of twist. For most of us, 
some ribs just stay fixed almost like fused and they need wd-40 or they they need some loving tender care they don't need jackhammering powerful mobilization they need to just learn oh i never thought of that part of me so as you're sitting on the front edge of the seat let's go back to the movement of the head very gently down and very gently up and when i say head i don't mean don't do this where your chest is stiff and you're moving the head like this relatively to fixed head no, think of natural movement. You look down, your whole back is starting to round. Then you look up to the sky and your whole back is starting to move. Now, can you feel your ribs? Can you imagine a ring of ribs some of you do too much. Some of you are bending really a lot. You don't need, you will feel more if you do less. You feel more. You feel those two pencils rotating in your spine, relatively to your spine. You will feel the upper vertebra tipping up a little bit around the bottom. Now, move your attention. As you're going forward and back, move your attention from the upper thorax, meaning rib number one and two first, two, three movements, upper thorax, right underneath your collarbone. Can you move that place? Can you think of those ribs going rolling up, rolling down, or upward and downward? rotation, anterior, posterior rotation to be very technical or precise. Now go to the mid thorax, three to seven. Vertebra number three to seven. Can you picture ribs turning? Which ones of that segment, those segments, you feel and which one you're completely in the void? You have no idea if they're there or if they're not. And now the lower thorax, meaning everything from 8, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Can you feel those ribs turning? Ribs turning. Upward and downward. Lovely. Stand up, walk around a little bit. Pay attention as you're walking. If you have space in your room, wonderful. If you don't have space, walk in place. Lifting one heel, lifting the other heel. And pay attention to those three sections of your thorax while walking. Can you feel motion in your upper ribs, first, second ribs? What do they do? Do they tip down and up? Is there a little bit of of undulation, extension, flexion, extension, flexion, or are they same level all the time? Are they turning? Meaning, is that ring rotating? Is manubrium, the handle of the sword in the front, the breastbone, turning a little bit right and left? Actually, place your index finger on your throat, slide it down until you get to that notch. That's called suprasternal notch, the top of the breastbone notch. And walk and feel, is that place turning little right and left as you're walking? Or is it always held up? 
or is it always depressed as if somebody was holding it down? Good, go to the next place, middle thorax. Think of the middle thorax, meaning ribs three and down. As you're walking, walking in place, working around, can you identify movements there? Movement of rib three, movement of rib four. What's holding that part of you? And somebody wrote to me, curious if you'll be getting into the emotional aspects because a lot of stuff comes up when working with the thorax. Absolutely. Absolutely. The body patterns of anxiety are locked into how we hold ourselves, how we hold the diaphragm, how we hold ribs, breastbone. So that work needs to be done gentle with understanding that sometimes you need to take a break if you feel too emotional, if some memories or difficult emotions are showing up, you know, you need to know how to take care of them. Rest a moment. There is another fantastic thing. Your heart, did you know that your heart is sitting? I mean, it's attached by ligament, by um, phrenocardiac ligament. Your diaphragm is like a floor for your heart. Your heart is riding on your diaphragm with each inhale, down, up, down, up. Your heart is attached through another ligament to your sternum. It's hooked like ropes on the boat that hold a sail. There are ligaments that hold your heart to the spot underneath your breastbone. And then your heart is also attached to your C6 the cervical vertebra, thora thoracic number two and number four. It has attachments. So your heart is hanging off of your skeleton. And of course, how we carry that part of us will impact how, how whether heart is always compressed, squeezed, or whether it has room to move, to, to move with each breath up, down, up, down. Come up again to standing and walk a little bit more. Think of your lowest of ribs. T12, T11, meaning rib 12, rib 11. Are they part of your gait? Do they have anything to do with advancing one foot, advancing the other, swinging your arms? Okay, when we walk so slow, some of you don't have much room, so you walk, not naturally, you don't walk like that on the, on the street. Some of us, when it's so slow, we start to walk like a zombie. And therefore, your whole ribcage is more or less like a box. It doesn't move much. But think you're going on the boardwalk, blah, blah, one leg, the other leg, arms are swinging. What happens in the 12th, 11th rib? How are you allowing them to be part of your gate? Wonderful. Stop. Come to the chair again. To the front edge. So you're not sitting all the way back. You're sitting on the front edge of the seat. Your pelvis is somewhat free. It's not like falling all the way back to the chair. Again, a few small movements of lifting up and lifting, lowering down your head, your spine, your chest. And listen to, if you were to exaggerate what you do, which part? of your thorax, you move the most when you do your habitual thing. Go ahead and do a few times where one part will move more than the others. Which doesn't need to be big. 
but that's predominantly, that's where I collapse or that's where my kyphosis show up. And like I said, each of us will have our own signature. Nobody's free. I wish to be like all universally moving freely. I have my things that move too much. If I don't work, if I don't do maintenance on myself, if I feel tired, if I feel stressed or insecure, things show up and places where are so familiar start to overwork. Now move in the place that's less familiar. Feel, what would it be like to move from another place? Down and up. First, we're just going forward, back. Small, small, gentle. And especially those very unfamiliar places. And many of us have those places that, that don't move much or they move just like maybe 5% of what they could. Be very gentle, not to forcefully start to mobilize them, but allow that just 5% of movement, but feel, aha, uh -huh, that's what would feel to move in the lower thoracic or middle thoracic, or upper thoracic, upper thorax. Very nice, stop a little bit, sit back, close your eyes, fall asleep for 15 seconds, 20 seconds, chill out. You've been focusing very much, now zoom out of your focus, daydream for a little bit, drool a little bit, fall asleep. Don't be too serious. Enjoy a moment of quietness. Come to the front of the chair, second movement, turning. Turn your upper thorax, meaning, of course, be functional. Turn your head and eyes. Turn your shoulders or whatever you would do that requires turning of the upper thorax. Small movement. Don't go to the limit. Don't go to the limit. Small movement. Just the beginning of turning right. And feel, what would it feel like from that first second rib? Remember that oval between the two fingers? That rib under collarbone, how it turns, that steering wheel that turns a little bit right and turns a little bit left. What would it feel like to involve that place? So it's not only your poor neck that does most of work. Now go to ribs number three to number seven, three to six, that middle section. Rib number fourth under your armpit. Can you imagine holding you? I'm holding you under your armpits, right under the axilla. I palpate the rib on the right side. I palpate the rib on the left side. And I'm asking you to turn your head a little bit right and left as if you were to cross the street. Or in walking, I might park my hands there and walk behind you. And I want to feel... Is she, is he moving? Are they moving right and left as they are walking or turning the head simply? Or is that place where the person feels, I don't know what to do. I need to fix it. I, I... And then if we go rib below, number five or number six, when you look peacefully right and left, are these parts moving on you? And most of you will find one direction you have a glimpse of it and the other direction may feel like a little bit, mm, not sure if I'm moving there. Go to the lower thorax. Seven, eight, nine, 10. Those cartilages in front wrapping under to the side. Are they part of you looking who's there on the right? Who's there on the left? crossing the street. And then finally, the 12 and 11 in the back. 
kidneys, those ribs that just stick out, are they part of you looking right and left? Turn a few times, highlighting your habit. Whichever you think your habit is, you look right and left, fix some other place. Don't move. Don't make it so wonderful. Move it in one place, but not in the other. Become aware amount of, of the effort that is necessary to hold that place. Because that's an interesting part. You're not gaining energy. You're losing energy. There is a leakage of energy in us in those places where we're holding. And sometimes we hold for good reason. We had injury. We are scared. We have emotional stuff. We're holding ourselves. And sometimes we're leaking energy because we don't know better. We got used to. It became habitual. It never occurred to us to use that part of the body. And then it's a forgotten land. And that's where we step in, in our Feldenkrais method, where we can start to open your, say hello to that place. Wonderful. Sit back, rest again. Close your eyes. Watch how you're breathing, how you're giving to the chair, to the pillow or whatever is supporting you. Or if you don't use anything, how you interact with the pelvis, with the seat bones, with the seat pan. Please come to the front edge of the seat. The third cardinal movement of ribcage. So we had the down and up, flexion extension. We had the rotations right and left. Lateral bending. Tilt your head, tilt your shoulder down on one side, up on the other. Don't stretch. Don't stretch. Think again, tightrope walker. Just getting this little lop, lop, lop. Very gentle right and left. The head tilts a little bit to the right. The head tilts a little to the left. And listen to, first to your habit. Don't fight your habits. Don't blame your habits. Don't shame your habits. Get to know them. Realize, oh, when I tilt my head, my ribs don't move. I move my head, but I don't feel anything of those rib ribs that the guy is talking about. I don't feel my shoulders lowering. Or I feel the upper ribs when I tilt right, but not to the left. Or I feel a lot in my lower back when I bend my head right and left. That's where I'm tilting my head from. Feel, what would it feel like to tilt the head from the lower back? Not from the upper ribs, not from the collar ribs, not from those upper rings, but predominantly where the Lower ribs enter your lower back or waistline and tilt your head like this to the right. Feel for some of you, it will be familiar. Oh, yeah, that's how I do this. For others, it will feel like, oh, that's so strange. And go to the other side. Good. Now shift to the middle section. Tilt right and left from middle section, not from lower. Not from upper, but from those ribs number three to six. The accordion of the ribs on one side, they come together. On the other side, they need to open up. And it's often the place that doesn't open up that is the problem. It's not the problem of there is no room to bring those together. The accordion cannot open on the opposite side. It's held. The muscles that are attached there and supply your arm, your shoulder, might be busy doing something else. Good. Now go with the upper thorax. Tilt your head from the upper, from that first and second rib only, or mostly. Of course, don't have to be 
mime to do that. You can just shift that wave a little bit up, a little bit middle, a little lower. And now entertain the idea of all of it as you go right and left, lower, middle, upper, every single pair of ribs move relatively to the other, simply, lightly, yielding to the movement, not forcing it, not mandating it, not demanding from your body to move, but rather permitting. Excellent, sit back and rest again. It's fine to collapse in the chair. It, it's fine to have bad posture, unless it's all the time. That is not fine. Sit a little bit, feel how you're breathing. Is your belly a little freer? Are your armpits a little freer? Is your jaw more relaxed? Are you slowly, abandoning tensions in the body, those tensions that are not needed. Come up to sitting in front and the last cardinal movements of the rib cage, of the ribs, translation. Think of your ribs shifting from right to left. Do a little salsa, salsa dance in your rib cage. Just a little shift right and left. So it's not anymore collapsing into compressing the side, but it's a little bit of dancing, of little bit of skating, shifting. Little right, little left. And feel which parts of your thorax you utilize for dancing salsa. Is it your upper? Is it your lower? Is it your middle? I don't know. I never thought of it. Well, this is a wonderful opportunity to recognize. Now, what would it feel like to do salsa from the upper to kind of like Balinese dancers, almost like the head and upper body moving a little bit, shifting, little right, left. Don't expect big movement, small. First, second rib, translating to the right, translating to the left, two, 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 two. simple. You might find, whoa, I don't know how to do that. I know how to side bend and tilt, but to translate, to yield, shoop, shoop, shoop. Now go to the middle section of your thorax. Think from armpits down, middle section going. Your ribs push into your upper arm on the right side, away from the left upper arm, and then vice versa. Your ribs moving toward the left, toward the right, toward the left. Are they shifting easier to one, one side? you might discover that one of your ribs or pair of the ribs is shifted toward one side. We see it very often with spinal pathologies, with lower back, with acute discs of lateral shifts. And now the lower parts of your rib cage. Think of those bottom 10, 11, 12. Do a little salsa from there. Beautiful. Stop. Stand up. And come to the floor, please. Pay attention to how you're lying on the floor, how you're resting. Bend your knees, please. And I will introduce you today to 
a concept that we will use throughout our the next four classes, something called false inhale or, or, or kind of like apnea. So have you seen, or maybe you have sleep apnea where, where you make the movement of your chest as if you were inhaling, but the air is not coming in. Epiglottis, that, that part in your throat, is closed, is sealed. So you're not drawing any air in, but pretend you're making a big movement with your chest, heaving movement with your chest. What will happen is your abdomen will be pulled in. See if you can get this motion. Pretend you're taking, let's do this. Completely exhale, full exhalation. Stop, seal that membrane, that diaphragm at the top of the throat, and then pretend you're inhaling, making huge chest, caving your belly in, but don't draw any air in. It, what lifts your belly under your ribs is the counter suction. And then, of course, inhale and breathe normally a couple of times. And then let's do it again. What you want to do is to learn to pull your belly inward, lift your diaphragm and your heart upward, north. And your chest expands to the sides, the breastbone lifts. Remember when I said that the heart is held by ligaments that attach to your neck, to your upper thoracic vertebra, to your breastbone. Now what you're doing, you're riding that heart on top of your diaphragm that is pulled up. Those ligaments have a chance to not be so stretched, to restore their full normal, normal length, not overstretched. And then again, inhale, you can lower your diaphragm, your belly will expand normally, naturally. And then again, exhale, fully exhale, fully, fully, fully exhale, nothing left. Seal your epiglottis and pretend you're taking huge in-breath. Chest widens and lifts, your belly gets sucked in. And then let go, breathe in, regulate your oxygen, get relaxed for a moment. Let's do it three more times. You may want to have your knees bent. Exhale, full exhalation, hold, and make your big chest lift, widen, belly gets sucked in, that apnea-like <clears throat> pull, and then release. But don't lift your head. Lift your chest toward your head. If your head is lifting or coming into your chest, you're actually not pulling the chest up, but bringing the head down, jamming the head, neck. Think of the chest lifting toward your spine of your neck. Beautiful. And now oscillate what we call in the Feldenkrais method seesaw between your belly and your chest and belly and chest. Expand your belly and then pull your belly in, heave your chest out and up. Expand your belly, your chest collapses. Don't do it abruptly. Switch from one position to the other. First, you can do it while holding your breath. As you get better, you can differentiate. You could inhale and continue doing belly, chest, belly, chest, belly, chest, seesaw. When one part goes to the ceiling, the other part goes to the floor. And then they switched. And this is not spinal movement. It's not about arching the back and flattening your back or tilting the pelvis. No, it's much more central. 
diaphragm lifts itself. For many of us, that's why I mentioned that sometimes belly breathing is not a good idea when done poorly by just distending the abdomen forward. You want your diaphragm to be able to come back up and then descend down on inhalation and come back up again. Another interesting part here is that while you are pulling your belly in, can you sense that your pelvic floor lifts up as well? Can you sense your pelvic floor lifting when you heave your chest, when you create that counter suction with that false inhale? You on the bottom of your exhale, pretend inhaling, making chest huge, sucking belly in and feel your pelvic floor lifts up. Lovely. Come back, leave it all alone, breathe for a moment. Normally, no need to do any seesaw, no, no need to do anything. Notice how much of your chest you sense in yourself, upper thorax, middle, lower, floating ribs, thoracolumbar junction. Beautiful. And come up to sitting, please. 